Good morning, everyone. I didn't realize it was these bright lights. Okay, hope I, hope, hope I survive. Okay, good. Um, let me read something. In a school, there are three important things. First, the parents. Second, the faculty. And third, the students. When I first read this quote, it's by St. Jose Maria, by the way, I was struck. Like, why parents first? And, you know, think about schools. I mean, they're built for students. We don't have parents come to class. Uh, we don't have parents, you know, you know doing, you know, uh, different types of work. Uh, as students, uh, the parents pay the bill. Uh, the way they may pay the bill to have someone do their taxes, or they may pay the bill to have someone, you know, fix their leaky roof. In a sense, a school is just like another service. Um, so why would St. Jose Maria say something like this? First, the parents, second, the faculty, and third, the students. Why that order? Um, why that primary role of parents? You may also be asking yourself, why, uh, if you're thinking about your teaching vocation, why talk about the primary role of parents? Or what's the connection? between my vocation as a teacher and the role of parents in education. My hope in this presentation, uh, first, would be to kind of address and try to shed some light on this primary role of parents. Then second, how our vocation as teachers is much more than just teaching math or music or theater, or in my case, art history. And precisely addressing what Alvaro talked about yesterday, which is we're transmitting a culture, a worldview, and why that transmission will only really take place if the parents are working with us, if there, there's alignment between the parents and the faculty and the school. The second part of the presentation will be more practical. How, how do we go about in this, what at the Heights we like to call a conspiracy for the good, right? How we parents and teachers working together uh, are going to make sure that you know Johnny does his homework and that Johnny becomes a better student and a better son uh, and a better friend. That's the conspiracy. That's why that term is a little you know edgy, but I like it, right? Because in a sense we are working towards the good of these young students who come to our schools. So let me first address this idea of parents uh, having that primary role in education, and this is from Paul the Sixth. He said. Since parents have given children their life, they're bound by the most serious obligation to educate their offspring, and therefore must be recognized as the primary and principal educators. Their role in education is so important that only with difficulty can it be supplied where it is lacking. It's interesting, uh, in our culture today, we see schools quite often, and especially certain types of schools, maybe public schools in certain districts, trying to usurp this primary right of parents. Uh, they're telling their kids to not tell their parents certain things, uh, and some of them are quite dramatic and life-changing and altering. Uh, when a school tries to supplant the parents, uh, things don't work. And I think it's really important to keep always that in mind, that we are, as teachers, secondary in our role as educators. The Pope continues, parents are the ones who must create a family atmosphere animated by love and respect for God and man, in which the well-rounded personal and social education of children is fostered. Hence, the family is the first school of the social virtues that every society needs. So it is clear, right, that the, the parents have this primary role. But what about us? What about schools? What about teachers, right? If you're thinking about this vocation, uh, how will I kind of work with parents in this goal? The Pope finishes by saying, among all educational instruments, the school has a special importance it is designed not only to develop with a special care the intellectual faculties, and this is a, the clincher, but also to form 
the ability to judge rightly, to hand on the cultural legacy of previous generations, and to foster a sense of values. It is here precisely that our role as teachers becomes so crucial, not just in teaching math or English or theater or whatever, but actually in teaching this cultural legacy that we're passing on, these values that we're passing on. Um, how do we do that? You know, how, how does this happen? Um, because the, the, the Pope is clear, like we need to do much more than just teach a subject. How we need to show this ability to judge rightly, to hand on the cultural legacy. So it is precisely in this secondary role, supporting the family, supporting parents, that we realize just how important the teaching vocation is and why it requires that we work closely with parents. We are more than just teachers communicating content. We're, in a sense, mentors who do indeed shape the life of our students, whether we know it or not. Students will often come to us not only for answers to math problems, but for answers to life's challenges. I think it's good to remember that, that when we engage in this great vocation, we're going to be supporting parents, informing their children, and passing on this culture that Alvaro talked about yesterday. It's interesting. Pope Benedict says the following. Always remember that teaching is not just about communicating content, but about forming young people. You need to understand and love them to awaken their innate thirst for truth, their yearning for transcendence, be for them a source of encouragement and strength. So as you begin to think about this vocation, um, as you begin to think about your role in education, this is what you've got to keep in mind, that is just more than a subject. Um, you know, let me give you an example of this. I was a young teacher some years ago, and I received a call from the father of one of my students. And he said, hey, Joe, um, I have an awkward thing to talk about. I, I taught this kid history and <coughs> English. And he said, you know, I was going through my kid's room because he's kind of a mess. It was very disorganized. And as I was going through his stuff and putting things in order, putting back things in the closet, I found a pornographic magazine under the bed. And uh, what do I do? And well, I thought, well, you can talk to him about it. He goes, well, but, you know, he didn't know I was going to be cleaning up his room. It's his, you know, his life, privacy. What am I doing? He's going to think I don't trust him. And I said, well, this is a great opportunity you have to help your son, right, address this topic. And this family was wonderful, and they, they didn't have phones. They, they, they were very good with filters. But, you know, a magazine is a magazine. Um, and... We had this great conversation. This father and I just like began to think, okay, what does a conversation look like? And uh, you know, first, you know, you gotta tell him this is not a good thing, obviously, but that you trust him, that you wanna make sure that he improves. But this is just one example. I mean, the conversation went really well. He called me back and, I mean, the kid is a terrific professional man right now and father of a large family. So things worked out really well. But I think it's important that to remember that as teachers, we may get calls like that sometimes. And those calls will come if we see our vocation as more than just a subject that we teach. Uh, when we realize that we need to love and like the kids in front of us, and the parent will feel comfortable because he knows we have their children's interests first and above all in mind. Um, another thing that is interesting about this is that um, quite often our students will remember us not so much for what we taught them, but for what we did for them. And I'm sure if I were to ask you to raise your hand, if you have a story from a teacher who taught you and you learned lots of things from him or from her, I have, at least half of you guys would raise your hand. There's always like, oh, I had this teacher who once told me this. And let me give you an example of that. I received an email this summer from one of my students. He's now in college. And he said, I just wanted to thank you for everything you taught me 
throughout my years at the Heights. During my time here in college, I have placed, I've been placed on the Dean's list for the last two semesters and earned various scholarships and grants. None of this would have been possible without one particular strategy you taught me in ninth grade. You may not remember, I don't by the way, um, but towards the middle of the year, I was struggling to keep all my courses and homework in order. You had me write all my homework on a sticky note and show you every morning. I still do this to this day and have not missed a single assignment during my time at college. I was really, you know, it's rarely do we get emails like this, um, but when you get them, it's kind of fun. You know, it's like, wow, actually things do work sometimes, you know? Um, but um, what's interesting about this is I, I had spent all this time preparing my English classes, all this time preparing my history lessons, and you know, I was like, you know, here's a, I'm a great teacher, I can teach all these great subjects. He doesn't mention any of that. He mentions the sticky note, <laughs> all right? And I, it, that really brought to light this sense that as teachers, we are really mentors. We're much more than communicating kind of a subject. We're communicating a culture, in this case, the culture of order and discipline. And I think it's really important to remember that, that we, how do we go about expressing and develop, developing this sort of talent of being more than just communicating uh, a subject matter, but rather being a really, really good teacher who really cares for his students, a true mentor. I remember one time, uh, this was, um, I don't know how many years back, and there was this teacher at the Heights who was kind of like distraught and he was like, I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm sick and tired of like, you know, correcting essays and you know, answering emails from parents and calls and whatnot. And the headmaster at the time told him, it was not Alvaro, it was very early on. Um, the headmaster says, listen, as teachers, we complete the work of creation, right? That as a, as a teacher, you're trying to, see this child that has been entrusted to your care, you're completing the work of creation. You're helping this person achieve much more than what he is now or she is now. Now, let's face it, the only way this is gonna work, the only way that all this advice, this mentoring, this support that you'll give your students will only work um, if the parents are with you. You know, the, the worst thing that can happen is you tell a kid, hey, why don't you try, you know, to, using a sticky note, or why don't you try maybe saying a, a little prayer before you go to bed. He goes home, tells his dad, and his dad goes, oh, that's dumb. It's over. All your efforts as, as a teacher, as a mentor, are gone. So you really have to think, how do I make sure that I am working with parents? So this conspiracy for the good, right? This conspiracy to get this kid to get to heaven, right? Like Alvaro was talking about yesterday. How do we do that? So I wanna talk about some practical ideas, right? After we get some of the, the big picture things, parents, primary educators, teachers as mentors. Okay, that sounds great. We love this idea of conspiracy for the good. This is probably why you are here. Um, but how do we do that? That's not an easy thing to do. And each one of us has a different personality. We're gonna be dealing with parents who may not be aligned with their mission. How do we do that? How do we go about achieving this great conspiracy for the good? I have some preliminary ideas and then some practical points. So preliminary ideas. Be clear from the very first time you meet with parents that they are the primary educators. And sometimes I say it straight up. Like, Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so, you are the primary educators. We're here to serve, to help you um, raise your, your children. Um, but it's good the way we say things, the way we introduce ourselves, uh, our demeanor should say, hey, what can I do to help in this great endeavor which has been entrusted with these kids? I can help you. Let me help you. How can I help you? Um, the tone, your approach, etc. Second. Be a good listener. Listen to what they say about their kids. And, and it's tough, right? Because sometimes you're like, yeah, your son is actually kind of lazy. Uh, or whatever, you know, you're like, ah, 
he doesn't quite see that, you know, maybe the problem is not so much that there's a lot of homework, but that he's not working, okay? And, and, and it, it, we can be very quick in saying, well, you know, the problem is this, the problem is that. Just listen to what they have to say. Um, ask him about their kid, how you can be of service, okay? They are the ones who live with him or with her, right? You only see them, we only see as teachers. We see the students for a few hours, maybe for one or two periods of the day, maybe at break. Um, but we don't see them all the time, over the weekends and during Christmas break, okay? So listen, we've got to be attentive. Um, and I think that requires a certain humility on our part, right? Because many of us are, have been teaching for many years. There's a number of principals and headmasters here, and we can think, oh, well, we know all the answers. But I think it's good to have that attitude of listening, humility. And then the last kind of preliminary idea that I would say is when you do need to say things that are difficult, um, to say it in such a way that it's not judging their role as parents, that's a really difficult thing, right? And we all struggle with different things, but the last thing we want to hear someone tell us, hey, you're a bad dad, right? That just, <laughs> it doesn't fly anywhere, and they would never listen to us. So I would say when we have to say difficult things, this sort of non-judgmental way, uh, to even say, like, hey, I'm going to suggest this, but listen, I could be totally wrong. But here's a thought. So those three ideas, you know, to be clear from the beginning that they're the primary educators, to even perhaps say it like that. Second, to listen, to be a good listener to what they say about their kid. And lastly, to have that non-judgmental approach to our suggestions, etc. Let's look now at some sort of more practical things. The first thing I would say is meet them early on. So if you're going to be a teacher, you're a teacher already, make sure you make the point of meeting them. If possible, face to face. I mean, sometimes it's not possible because we may have many students. But maybe a call could be a wonderful thing, better than an email, I would say. Um, have that ready. And it's not easy, right? Because uh, if you have been a teacher for some time, you know how difficult it is to juggle all these duties that we have. And reaching out to a parent, it's time. It's, it's really a lot of time because he's going to say, oh, yeah, we'll have a meeting. But then you go back and forth three times to set up the time. And if you have 25 t students, that's a lot of time. But that's part of being a mentor, right? Having that attitude of service uh, to want to meet with the parents. Second, after that first meeting where they see you face to face, they get to know you, I think a lot of kind of follow-up, uh, sometimes I use the expression touch points, but you know, whether if it's an email, um, whether if it's a, a call, like, hey, by the way, I remember one of my colleagues here who in Lent, uh, one Lent, he decided to, as his sort of his, you know, Lenten resolution, he was gonna make, he was gonna make one call every day to one set of parents. I thought that was kind of a cool idea, right? I'm, every day, I'm gonna call one parent to say hello, to say how his kid is doing, whatever. Um, but I think we, could be, we need to be very intentional about this because we are gonna be very busy and um, meeting, talking with parents often is very important but not urgent at all, right? Because if there's nothing wrong, why should I call the parents? But if you're thinking long-term, you're thinking the soul of this kid, then that call is actually quite important that we may not see at that moment on a Friday night or, or excuse me, on a Friday afternoon or whatever we're gonna decide to make that call. But I would say um, be deliberate. Maybe put it in your calendar. Now with Google calendars and all these things so easy, they pop up like, oh yeah, today I'm gonna call a set of parents. Um, yeah, takes time, but really important. If you wanna achieve this conspiracy for the good, we always gotta keep that in mind. Um, the third thing I would say that another practical idea is that if you're gonna meet with a student to talk about tests or to talk about some virtue or to talk about whatever, especially if your school has a mentoring program, but even if your school doesn't, uh, this is something you can always do, is call the parents in advance or send an email, say, hey, by the way, I'm gonna be meeting with Johnny next week. Is there anything you want me to talk to him about? It's a wonderful thing to do. And you'll be surprised. I remember sending an email once and I got like, two pages uh, of an email. I was like, well, maybe I won't send him an email again. <laughs> uh, 
No, um, it was actually very helpful, and I, I, I think he, he just needed to like unload. And that's also good, you know, quite often parents don't have anyone to unload with, and, and we can be that kind of um, listener. So it can be really helpful. Maybe you don't realize that a particular student is going through a certain struggle at home, and then you realize, oh, wow, this is why he's not doing his homework. His house, things are, at home are not really going well. But you wouldn't have known that had you not, had you not sent that email prior. So I would say whenever you're going to meet with a student, a practical thing you can do is talk to the parents first uh, to let them know you're going to be meeting with them. A fourth practical idea, bump into them by chance, right? You know that Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so picks up his son or her son at a certain time. Maybe that day you happen to be in the parking lot. Hey, how's it going? And then you talk, right? It happened to be a chance encounter, but in fact, you actually planned it. Same thing with games, right? You, maybe there's a soccer game or, a, or there's a play that is gonna happen, you know, theater, and you make the point of being there. And, and you know, there are tricks of doing this, by the way, so it doesn't take all your life. Um, sometimes I'll come to a play, you know, this is, maybe I shouldn't say this, well, I'll say it. Um, I'll come to a play and I'll be at the beginning of the play greet parents, and then sit down and then walk the other way and not stay for the play, right? Because I, you know, we all have you know, family to take care of and different things to do. But I think being strategic about how we um, make sure that we accidentally meet with parents is a good thing, and it really helps in this conspiracy for the good. Um, another interesting thing, and this is one that we all will encounter at some point as teachers, it's difficult conversations and difficult situations that you need to address with parents. I would say, again, be very strategic. And that means if you know that you're gonna have a conversation, you need to tell them about this F that his son got in the class, or you, you perceive that this may be coming in the horizon. Well, you could meet with them the week before at the soccer game and say, hey, hello, how are you? Yeah, your son is you know, struggling a little bit. I'm, I'm, you know, let's see what we can do, right? And then suddenly the week after, yeah, he gets the F. And then you send the F to home, and, but they'd be like, oh yeah, I talked to so-and-so. I know that this is gonna, I could see this coming. And they will not be surprised. And they'll be happy that you're con in contact with them. So I would say, be strategic. And that's just a grade. But what if a kid is, you know, actively bullying other kids, or what if, you know, he's being disrespectful, or what if you find out something that is kind of difficult to talk about? If you've been done your homework, right, if you've been strategic about having these meetings, if you've had met with them in person, towards over the beginning, then the, the reception of your suggestion, the reception of your comments are gonna be much more accepted, and they're gonna be much more willing to listen to you, uh, to ask questions, so I think it's, it's important to keep that in mind that if you're thinking of helping this son, uh, this child, this son, this daughter go to heaven, we need to be really thoughtful about this, right? Because that's a big deal. It's not just getting an A in math. It's, um, as one said, it's not about the kingdom getting into the kingdom of Harvard, but the kingdom of heaven. Um, I'm borrowing that line, and I'm sure you've heard it a million times, but it is true. It's a lot more difficult. Um, Good, other things that we can do, for example, on this same topic, um, this idea of like difficult things to say, um, you need to really, when you actually speak about the topic with the parents, they need to understand that you love the kid, right? They, they need to, it's not like casting aspersions, your kid is such a pain, okay, we won't say that obviously, but, but it may come across that we're saying it, and maybe you need to say, hey, listen, what I want to say is actually difficult. And I'd rather not say it, but I think I want your son to really be a great man someday. I'm going to have to say this. So you kind of prep them for this, and then you say it. Like, yeah, this happened or that happened. And it's a, the parents will appreciate that tremendously. Uh, because you are showing tremendous affection for them. Uh, you're respecting them as parents and as primary educators. Uh, but you're saying things that are difficult. Also, another practical point that can be really helpful on this matter is especially for those of you who are younger or just getting started or will get started in a few, in a couple years, is get advice from experienced administrators. They've seen that before. 
I mean, if you've been in administration for five, six, ten years, you've probably seen pretty much everything uh, because human nature is pretty much always the same. Um, so go get, don't be afraid to say, hey, you know, I have this situation. What do you recommend I do? What's a good idea? And then be docile, listen, and, and you're like, oh, I don't, oh, that doesn't make any sense. The guy who's speaking to you has experience and has seen situations like that. So really, really uh, super important that you ask for advice uh, from experienced teachers, experienced administrators. Another practical idea, um, be specific. Your kid is lazy. Okay, well that, that's maybe true, but that doesn't help parents figure out what to do with that. So I think the more specific you can be, the better. And maybe you can say, well, he sits, you know, slouches where his back is about to fall off the chair. Uh, he's always late to class or, you know, very specific things. And then one thing, this is, this is the, the, the clincher. Make sure you, have, you offer solutions. I think it's very easy to see problems. What's difficult is to offer solutions. And also because those solutions often uh, require our time. Well, as teachers, we're going to have to like check off something or sign the document before they go home, right? Things like that. So I, I think that idea of like be specific, detailed examples, and then make sure you offer suggestions on how to improve. How you work with the parents on that very closely. Um, I have uh, another way, and this is kind of now looking more at the side of the student on how to get parents, kind of the student to work with the parents because it's part of the conspiracy. One of the things I do is I ask them, uh, if your mom was here sitting in this office, what would she say you need to work on? And the kid is like, ah, oh. oh, my mom would say this, 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 this. Okay, well, why don't we start working on that, right? And then you tell the parents, I'm working with your son on these things, or one time I remember asking a kid, hey, so what would your dad say you need to work on? I don't know. <laughs> he had no clue. So I said, well, go home and ask. So he went home, and I got a list from the dad, like, I need to work on this, 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 this. And I'm sure the dad had told his son many times what he needed to work on. But had I not made that connection, that relationship between the father and, and myself with the son, uh, it would not have been there. We, the kid would have been kind of oblivious mm -hmm. to what he needed to work on. So it's very good to have the kid kind of connect to what the parents are saying because sometimes they won't listen. Also, uh, when speaking with students, let them know that you work closely with the parents, with his parents or her parents. I think it's good that they know that. And I even use the term, like, we're here to help you. And your parents and I are going to be working together. So, you know, make sure that you know that. I think it's good that, you know, often we'll talk about you and we'll try to figure it out. And we always say good things and we're trying to help you. Um, so, but it's good that he knows that he's like um, aware of that relationship, that conspiracy for the good. The last thing I would say regarding students is that students often will not listen, especially as they get older. Uh, sophomores, whew, sophomores can be tough. Uh, Juniors and seniors, they become a little more manageable. Uh, but there's a point when they enter into high school where they're like, my parents are so wrong about everything. And I have all the answers to all the problems in the world. My parents don't know anything. Um, and it's good to tell them, uh, actually, that's not true. Uh, when your parents tell you to do this or to do that, what they want is that you become a great man. Because the other option is that they, you become a failure. And they don't want you to become a failure. And they always smile when I say that. And they understand it, like, OK, I've got to listen to my parents more. So anyway, this conspiracy for the good. You, as a teacher, as a mentor, kind of working with the parents, uh, <coughs> triangulating sometimes uh, to make sure that the kids you know, we transmit this culture, this worldview that will take them to heaven. To conclude, I hope I have been able to show how our vocation as teachers is much more than simply teaching a particular subject matter. That as teachers, we are called to be mentors who working closely with parents will shape the students entrusted to our care to great men and women. And I will finish with a quote from St. Jose Maria. He wrote, and it's a letter that I would recommend that you read at some point. He 
he wrote a letter on education. It's about 50 pages or so. And in one of the, let in one, in one of the paragraphs, he says, and with this, I will finish. Parents are the first and main educators. And they must come to see the school as an extension of their family. To this end, we as teachers must stay in constant contact with them and bring them the warmth and light of our Christian work. Thank you.